wonky more. And I uh, hope I said that like a real wonky more. <laughs> um, I ever, how many people here have ever seen the Craig Ferguson show? Craig Ferguson is like... This is going to be awesome. Like, I feel like he has, he has this robot skeleton thing that's it's, it's his it's his mock co-host it's it's in the corner and it says sarcastic things and um it was developed by the uh what, what's the what's the show called where they go those guys like shoot shoot stuff up and test stuff you know those Mythbusters. You myth, it was built by the mythbusters guys i feel and he's, he stands in a corner and he talks about how he's plugged into the wall so he can't go anywhere so that's what i feel like in my little corner here but <laughs> My little Mac Mini is right here, and uh, I'm, I'm relegated to this corner. I'm Lewis Berman, the PhD I get to put on there because I got one about three years ago. That and four dollars gets you a cup of coffee, a cup, cup of coffee at Starbucks. Um, but um, so interestingly, um, just want to say a word about myself. What I did for my PhD was, um, in the world of sound, I, I, uh, there's there's something called sonification, which is the sound equivalent of visualization. And so what I did was I sonified an Eclipse development environment. I, you can actually hear things about the project, the, 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 the classes and methods and stuff you're working on. So that was, that was my research. And that had, <laughs> well, that was part of my research. That had a, He'll be giving a talk on that afterwards. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, so I, I ended up saying a lot about that in the Baltimore meeting or the Columbia meeting. And, and, uh, but what I had, I mentioned in passing that I had done some, just as a play project, as something for sort of academic and, and demonstration reasons, I had done some C integration with Python, where C call, I mean, where Python calls C. And in that music, in that computer generated music and sound world, I had done some integration where something called C sound, which is simply, which is totally written in C, hey, go figure. Um, call stuff in Python. So I've sort of done work with integration both ways. But I'm mainly going to talk about the Python calling C. And I'm sure some of you have a lot more years of experience with Python and maybe even in the tools, the tool I'm going to talk about. So if you have anything to add or, or there's some clarification about something I can't fill in, just feel, feel free to chime in. Um, I have talked about myself already. If you want to contact me, I'm subscribed to the group. I'm Lewis Berman on LinkedIn, etc. You can get that later too. So, so why would why would you want to call C stuff from, or or for that matter, C plus plus stuff from Python? And there might be more reasons than this, but what I came up with was first of all efficiency. Um, clearly, you want you want to implement something in C. If, if maybe you want to implement something in C if you just absolutely need the maximum efficiency. Um, you can use existing C libraries, so you, and you can take various libraries and kind of build wrappers around them. And something that came up recently uh, that I just learned about recently was uh, what's it called? GIL, Global Interpreter Block. So apparently, most of what you do in Python, and correct me if this is wrong, apparently most of what you do in Python is Kind of, kind of single thread threaded as far as the processor is concerned. So, of course, there's libraries, uh, which we were discussing in the car, that you, where you could get around that. But another way to get around it is just, just write your, your code in C and then just create threads and do what you want. So that's a couple reasons for that. C so can call Python functions, so why do that? Um, there's some pretty powerful libraries out there like SciPy and other stuff that you might want to integrate with. The odd thing there is that they're probably built for efficiency and they are ultimately have a lot of stuff coded in C. Um, you can write supporting code using lists and doing sort of a higher level of programming than you can do in C, so maybe you want to do that. I'm stopping any time with questions, too. So the goal of what I did here, just as a demonstration, was to, I, I wanted to implement some kind of non-trivial data structure and um, call it from a Python, build it in C and call it from a Python module. Um, so I, I actually decided on what's called a tri, T-R-I-E, also pronounced tree, which is the proper pronunciation of it. We'll get to that in a second. And that particular type of data structure is good at this text completion stuff, right? You get on a website and you type in something and it shows you all the 
possible completions. And every so often it does some polling or something and, and you type a few more characters and it restricts the list even more because you've given it more information. That's the kind of thing I was trying to do. Um, a, little, a little bit about the data structure is not really related to the actual integration, but it's, it's interesting, so I would have thought I'd include it. So let's say you have a collection of countries. I actually, I had some data I was using for a, a different project, and I had countries, and I had a whole bunch of data about the countries. That might have actually been something I presented at that, that other meeting, I can't remember. Um, so, um, so here we have a bunch of countries, a selected number of countries that start with B. And some of them have common first letter, some have a common second letter, and even third letter. And so the whole idea of the tree, or try, I'll try to call, I'll try to call it a try, um, just, just to go back in history about this data structure, I, I think the data structure was invented at, in about 1960. And of course, back then, I guess the terminology was a lot less sort of set in stone and a lot looser. And so this person, whoever invented it, uh, I have some references to it if you want them, uh, called this a T-R-I-E, but it pronounced it tree. And it's really the middle part of the word retrieval. Um, but in order to not um, confuse it with a general tree, we'll call it a try, which a lot of people call it. So in the data structure, you can store a single character or you can store a string. Actually, in my version, uh, well, I'll get to that in a minute. But So here's a node, and you store B in the node. That's the start node. Well, the start node's probably out here, and if you type in B, you get to this node. And then if you type in the next letter, it takes you, say you type in an R, so it takes you here. And if you type in a U, it takes you here. And, you, and now you have the word completion, because there's no conflict between that and any other word. So this is a special kind of tree, and I do mean tree, that um, has kind of n, n no, child nodes. Uh, and the difference, not that, not that this matters, but the difference how I implemented it was every node only has one character. So you would have to actually follow a string all the way out one character at a time and get to the completion. So the the key thing you're trying to implement here, other than populating the data structure, is as you type characters into Python, you want to call repeatedly call this C function, start at the right node, because you don't need to start at redundant nodes you've already passed through, and and keep returning um, completions. Was that the question? Yeah. Uh, maybe I'm getting ahead of myself, but you're passing the, the try back and forth between C and Python? Right? You're not. The data structure lives in C. Okay. What you're passing, what you're going to pass to C, is a word. So you're typing a partial word. You're typing yeah, the either the characters or the whole word, however you implement it. You're passing that to C. And what you're getting back is a list of possible completions. So the C program is actually going to format a Python list of possible completions, and then it's up to Python to display that. Other questions about the Structure? Oh, and um, for the computer scientists out there, I'll say something about its runtime. I think that a binary search is, what is it, order of, or, order of log, n. Log, n. log n to the base 2. This is like log n to the base m, where m is possibly the, I forget what m is, but it's larger than 2. Massive it's got number of children. Maximum number of children, okay. So the alphabet size. So it's, it's what? So the alphabet size. Yeah, the alphabet size. So it's it's supposedly um, better than uh, a regular uh, binary type tree uh, traversal. Oh, yeah, a demonstration, right. So I had to remind myself that's the place for the demonstration. Now, where did the, here it is. So can, every, can any, everyone see down toward the bottom there? I'll try to bring it up a little bit. So the, the, the kind of shell program I call T-Shell. Sorry. No, I don't need that. There, I implemented, I just 
for lack, for lack of any creativity, I implemented something called Do It. The first thing Do It does is it loads the countries. It tells you what's populating the countries. And as I, as I recall, I originally did that in C, but I think the population now occurs in Python. All that's doing is taking a file and, of these countries, which are in a larger, a larger sort of a multi-dimensional array, and then reading the country names out of it. So um, then we start typing. So let's do our Bs. Can everyone see over to there? Yes. Um, so if I just type in B, I get all these countries. And I've typed in the B character, and now I'm going to type in, let's see, E. Now I've gotten less countries that start with B, E, and let's see, B, E, L. So, and finally, if I type I, we end up with Belize. And if I type some other character like M, we get a null set there. So um, we can run the thing again, same thing, A, Z gives me Azerbaijan. So, Usually the uh, usually the completion only takes a couple characters, but that's only because my country list is a really small data set. It's like it is all the countries in the world, but that's what a couple hundred countries. Well, maybe a thousand, five hundred countries or something. Um, this can be used on incredibly large data sets. So that's the whole demo. Easiest demo I've ever given. What could go wrong? No. Okay, we're going on time. So DiskUtils provides the mechanism to do integration in a fairly straightforward way. You you can of course do it not using DiskUtils, but you have to do a lot more programming. Um, the elements of what you'll need to do to make this happen are certain files in Python and C, your source files, but your but some other files we'll see. These API calls in C that start with py underscore uh, from python.h and um, that's what gives you re passing the parameter or getting the result. And some supporting C functions we'll look at that kind of make the connection between the C and the Python objects or names I should say. So here's the files we have. Um, I'm going to first show you build tree dot, I did it again, build try whatever dot sh, which is just my little command script that's going to call try setup, which is kind of a standard, a standard sort of a thing. Um, then uh, t shell dot pi is my program, my shell that I showed you, and get ch is a get character function that lets you get a character without hitting character return and get, it, it implements a get ch function. Um, the C code is called try mod, tree module, uh, there I go again, try module dot C. Uh, and on, on Linux or Unix, this creates a plain shared, shared object file. On Windows, it creates something called PYD, which is a pi, it's not really a wrapper, it's, it's, a, it's a DLL, well, you, most of you probably know this, it's a DLL that has some additional Python information in it. So the build to build the thing, that's my command. That's what you would put on a command line or in my little shell script. It calls tree setup.py, and that build ext tells it to build a Python extension. Um, so the, what it's calling, what it's what it's using is. Uh, this is provided by DiskUtils, I guess. It's uh, uh, maybe more of you know more about this build type stuff than I do. But what it's really telling you is build a module from the code tree module.c. And I'm assuming you could put multiple C file names in there, whatever. Anyone have any questions or comments on that or anything they'd like to add to that? Can you leave it up for a second? What? Can you just leave it up for a second? Yeah. So, the setup function is, uh, comes from uh, comes from what again? I'm not sure. I think all of this is part of disutils. So you don't need an import statement? Not for this, no. This is the that's the entire file, the entire setup file. So you're calling py you're calling that with Python. So I'm assuming setup is some built-in function. I'm, I'm right. I'm not importing anything in particular. Now, probably importing implicitly because of that build ext. And what's the dash on it? 
I'm not sure why that's there. It, it was in the example. The dash I means if you execute a script, then go to interactive mode. I've actually never tried taking it out and seeing if it made any difference or not, so I just sort of left it there. I never questioned it uh, until until riding down here in the car. I never thought to actually do anything about it. This stuff um, at the end, I'll show you some doc where the documentation is in uh, the Python site, and um, it's all there. So some of this is examples that's that's taken from there. Did okay. You have to build the the shared object yourself, or is it, is it that built the shared object. That's the main thing that that did. It builds the share object, shared object. What is the problem? And I guess it imports what? I'm sorry. Try module C is my source code. The previous one, the extension. That's just the name. The name of the extension. So to Python, the module is going to be called try. So that's where you're naming the module. That's where you're naming the module. That's where, naming module. That's where I'm naming the module that completely consists of the C code. Does it have to be the same as the name? It's anything. Okay, so the, so the try, the identical tries are just, are not required? No. Okay. As far as I know, I, I, mean, I haven't even checked that, so I, I don't think so. So you don't need to set up any environment variable line that says what you're going to copy? No environment variables. Right. Yeah. Like where's, where's your, where's the, what's compiling the sequence? You're calling Python. It's it's all built into the Python. Like I, I mean, so if I mean, would you mind compiling it for us? Could, I mean, yeah. Would you compile? Yeah. I mean, you'll see that all the CPP flags are set for you automatically. Yeah. Yeah. It sets this, flags. You'll get the same flags that Python itself was compiled with. Okay. <laughs> Well, not try, SH, it's my, my file. All right, so. Okay, here we go. You'll see some C, whoops. Oh, because it's all, it's all there already. We should at least. Oh, we, 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 <laughs> well, I was going to get rid of those, but there's not, it's not necessary. We just, I'm going to get rid of the shared object. Don't worry, I have it. We're, we're just remembering back to when you said, oh, the simplest demo ever. What could go wrong? <laughs> there's a reason I said that, right? I'm, I was being facetious. What couldn't go wrong? <laughs> so, um, okay, I'm getting rid of the shared object, I'm not getting rid of pi anything. Okay, now let's try it. There you go. Yeah. So okay. all of those switches, it's architecture switches and everything else in there. And now we have the shared object again. Okay. Can you back up for a second? Yeah. I'm not used to. Okay. You want to go back to the slide or to the command line? No, this is fine. I just want to look at the command line. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Tell me how long you want to look at that command line. <laughs> are, are you running Mac OS 10.3? 10 10.4. Probably. Four. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't do updates. <laughs> no, I'm, what am I running? Because it's right there. Well, just tell oh, me. Oh, right, right, right. <laughs> Actually, you tell me. Well, <laughs> I'm not sure what Mac OS I'm running. I'm not primarily a Mac person, and I use this for my thesis, and I haven't done a lot of updating it since. In fact, it's not even usually turned on. Do you know? Do you know if this would be different in three, Python three, or it's completely the same? As far as I know, all this would be the that I'm showing you would be the same. I don't know of any Python three features that would change anything. Um, <laughs> I don't use three. I was just wondering. So what? What are we up to now in terms of uh, Mac? Ten nine. Ten ten. I'm sure. I'm sure I'm beyond ten three. I'm sure I'm beyond that. What? It would have GCC. Yeah. If if. That's just how old. It is. 
Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, that's the new one. They don't use GCC anymore. Right. Right. I think I loaded GCC and it never quite worked right or something, so I'm not sure. I did load the, I did put the latest X code on there and it works, so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I forgot I did that. I did that since I worked on this stuff. Um, Barry, do we really have to go to the beginning? Double click. Okay, moving on. So I'm going to show you some code snippets. Um, my first thought was to just go through the code, and I realized I'm sure I'd forget something, so I, I sort of pasted in some code snippets here. So from Python angle, this is this is in the t shell.py. It's pretty simple. We import tree because. It knows try because it knows it's a, it's the try module. We we showed you that in the build file. We define some function called do it, and then we call try init, and then that notice that that has no we don't pass any arguments on that. That'll be important on the next slide. And then we call try dot subs. That's a name known to Python, but it's not going to be the same name in C. And we'll get to how that mapping occurs. And then we, we're calling that with a single argument, a string. So we're going to return a list of all the words that complete the input string. Um, so here's the initial is that here's part of the initially relevant parts of the initialization function, which we call first. And notice that um, we I'm defining my now I'm in C. I got to change it. Think in C. So uh, you have to include python.h, and that gives you all these various things like pi object. So we we define a um, class or a a, a, a a object of the type pi object, and we're calling initialize try to return it. And you it's it's like a class, I guess. You you put the self the magical self thing in there first, and um, um, not that we have to. Add, it, it, it is like a class. We don't have to identify that on, on the um, in the calls. I'm sorry. I forget what I said. Forget I said anything there. We we are identifying that in the call, and we're passing in an argument list. And this is going to be, I believe, a Python list of the no. It's it's just going to be a list of the arguments, but it's it's a um, obviously it's a collection in C of Pi objects, um, and I think you would pass it in as a list from Python, but I'm only passing in one argument. What's that? Python code you call dot init. Is that what you're calling it? Tree try dot init. And right. It maps to this. Function. It maps to this function, even though it's called initialize try. I will show you in a minute how it maps, but all the function names are different. The receiving function names are different. If you make them the same, do you have to map them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. It still doesn't know about the mapping. Okay. And then it does its stuff, and then there's something called pi. This is a simple way to return a single value. It returns a pi build value. Uh, uh, the i means, of course, return it as an integer. You could use s for a string. You can use a variety of things there. And you give it a value. And so I'm just saying true. So. Return one. So any that's it. I mean, any question about the Python code? That's the whole relevant part of the Python source. And that's the initialization. Then to to actually go through and um, <coughs> once whenever you type a character, I'm not showing all that part. There's a loop, and and you, you it does a get character, and you type the character, you type the character, it does a get character, and every time it calls get all substrings. Again, it's a different name and we're going to, actually in this case, that it will be the same name, but that's just happenstance. It's just, I just, you know, it doesn't have to be. Um, and so ours here will actually be, oh, uh, ours was not used. Ours here is going to be that string that we passed in, a single argument. So there's a function called arg parse tuple. There's a couple different functions for um, parsing the arguments. And it passes the arguments, I said a list, it passes the arguments in as a tuple. So here we're taking the Python tuple 
and we know we only have one element of it, so we're, we're putting it in in string. And that's how we get our C string. Um, and the error code is like, if, if that didn't work, we'll return zero, which would be a fail. Uh, we'll return an empty list. Um, actually, I think, I think we're returning an empty list with zero, an, a, a list with zero in it. And then we do our work here, and then on the next page, uh, when we when we do our processing, and we, we have we we come up with this thing in C called a list of names, um, and actually what we come we don't come up with list of names in C. Now let me see if I can sneak out here. Um, what we have in C, which this code I'm not showing you, we could look at the code if you want to, but to implement the data structure. It's, it's a list. It's a linked list of nodes. So each one of these nodes stores a character, and each one of these nodes also has a forward pointer to the next uh, list, at list item, and the he head initially points to the head of the list. So this is, this is your string, character by character. And what we're doing, um, what we're doing here is taking this list of names, which we've created as a new object, uh, whose size was, we know it's going to be, the, we know the number of items already because we're doing this at the end. Um, and we set the item to the head and then um, we, once we're done with the head, we don't need it anymore, so we just get rid of it and make this the head and then we keep returning the head until we've reached the end of the list, standard link list type stuff. And um, uh, each time we're setting an item, uh, yeah, I have it. Okay, I'm incrementing i. So each time we're setting an item whose index is i, and then we have a list, and we're returning the list. So this is effectively like a push, or not a push. You're pushing. Uh, no, you're simply copying. You're taking a value. This is all C stuff. This the linked list is C stuff. You're taking a value out of this C linked list, and simply you're right. You maybe you're pushing a value onto the list. Yeah, but we're not really pushing it. You're actually you're doing it by its index. You're setting it. You're, you're setting it, yeah. Questions? Other questions on this? So then um, returning list of names, it's already a Python object, and that's what returns a Python list to the caller. Okay, so now I said there was some other code that goes in. And this is where we make, this is, starts to be where we make the mapping. Uh, how am I doing? I guess I need to wrap up in five, seven minutes. Yeah, but you're good. Um, <clears throat> so first of all, these simply, these simply come up with strings, right? So um, this, is, uh, this is still C code. So um, we're saying that we have a, a, a character array, and, and that's this, this documentation text. So all we're doing on this page is just creating these arrays that are going to become the documentation stuff. When we go to the next page, uh, we, uh, here is where we, this is, this is the core connecting glue. So, um, pi method death. And um, so you can see that actually there's, there's some more, there's actually four, Three, was it three functions here? But I'm ending up not using populate. So here's our init function, and here's our get all substrings function. To Python, it's called init. To Python, it's called subs. To um, C, it's called initialize tree and get all substrings. So that's where we make the connection. Um, here we tell it how we want to pass the, the, and this is the standard Python method for passing arguments, but there's some other options like no args and some other stuff you can look at. Uh, and then this is that string we set on the last uh, slide, so that's the documentation string that goes along with, uh, with either the class or the, well, I should say the module or the method, depending on which. And then there's some other arguments that I haven't dealt with. Um, it's all in the documentation. Um, What's the null no, null? No. Again, these are other arguments that were not necessary for what I'm doing, and they may be, they may put further control on the, uh, on the. Uh, 
It's actually a, it's it's like a it's like a last entry that you have to put in with these arguments. So I, I don't I, you'd have to go to the documentation. Anyone anyone have any ideas on that? So it's you have to go to the documentation. <laughs> it's probably yeah. It's probably like a like a, a C string terminator kind of thing where you need a null <laughs> thing at the really end. No. Yeah. Um, and then you call pi init module to actually initialize the module. That's that's how you do it. This utils gives you all this stuff. Uh, So you can integrate with C++ also, and the only difference there is you have to, in the C code, C++ code, you have to declare all of your um, functions as external C functions so that, so that the disutil stuff will recognize them as C functions, not, not some kind of C++ function. So these are your forward declarations. And that's the only difference. Now there's some things I recommend, I think this is an excellent, there's some things I recommend that you do when you're testing. <coughs> so when you test, of course, you want to keep complexity low. So if you're testing something like this data structure, of course, you would like to write it in C and then test it in C. So you write the, the main program, and so you have a main program, right, that you've written in C. You have this various code. So when you call stuff from the main program, you're not calling pi arguments, and you're not having to do anything with the pi arguments. So I, I su suggest you stick a bunch of the you stick define from Python in there, and then if from Python is defined, you put a bunch of if that's in for the code that has to vary. So um, um, here, here we only in this one we only have the if because the C version is just passing an argument basically. Um, and I may not have included everything, but this this is common code, so the, the end if is here. And I don't know, there's there's probably varying schools of thought on how to unuglify the the whole structure of if defs and everything, but um, I, if you have ideas on that, I'd, we'd love to hear them, I think. I mean, you don't want to make the whole thing one big if def, you would just want to make the if defs for the variable parts. So I suggest doing that and testing your, your code in, totally in C until you know it works. This is a little more on the var args method. Um, and this just tells you what I already told you. The first one is the module object. And the second one is the list of arguments. There, we used pi arg parse tuple. There's also something called pi arg unpack tuple for, sim for simpler kinds of tuples. You can look at the documentation to see which one you rather use. And here's the documentation. It's at docs.python.org and it's called, I meant to put the title on there, I think it's called Extending Python with C or some, some title like that. And it's all pretty much spelled out there. I have to read it a couple times to really get it, but it's spelled out. And that is that. Any other questions? Yes? Um, so why did you go the this utils route? I mean, there's like a handful of other ways to integrate with C. Probably because I did a web search to see how to do it, oh. and it's the first thing that came up from Python.org, well, and it's not it's not very complicated. I think it's really. So yeah. what's an alternative? Uh, so I so there's some. Support. I mean, what you showed here. I have me personally. I have two problems with it. One is there's way too much boilerplate, mm -hmm. and the other one is. Mixing in like C stuff with the with the pipe with the Python.h stuff. So I've played with. Uh, so now there's like things like Swig. There's um, Boost. there's Boost. Boost, and there's now the newest thing is uh, something called CFFI, and there's Swig. Swig I've heard of. And uh, so I mean those things you can reduce the boilerplate. You're saying you write C more like it's just pure C. Yeah. So, so it does so this stuff things, in the. So some of they'll they'll write the boilerplate for you, um, and then they'll call this utils on the, on their own. Yeah. Or oh yeah, there's also C types. That's yeah. really cool. Um, but I like CF, I like playing with CFFI. I mean the boilerplate with CFFI, especially if you're writing, if you're gonna write simple stuff, it's like almost none. It's like here's the function. Like it's just it kind of understands how to map Python and Python and C mm -hmm. on its own. Mm -hmm. So. I'm coming from a scientific computing background, and we do this stuff all the time. 
So we hate letter plate. We just want to get our work done. Um, so I mean, that's just my observation. I like what if you've looked at any of any of the other ways of uh, interfacing with C. Well, some of them sound like. I mean, they might skip the disutil till step, but they're some of them sound like they might generate some code yeah, for do. you. And, yeah. Yeah. No, I, I'm all, I'd be all for that. It's fine. Did you compare performance? I didn't for this. Um, no, I didn't compare performance for this. The problem is the data sets I could come up with are so small. Even if they're thousands and thousands of strings, they're still so small. I guess I could have randomly generated. Um, I, well, first of all, I would have had to implement the thing in Python, which is fine, could do that, and then compare them. And I, I guess I would have had to generate some random collection of, you know. I think Twitter could give you that. <laughs> Twitter. <laughs> yeah. You could just run the Python it's true. on Twitter and you get a bunch of junk. <laughs> and, and then, a fair point. then uh, from, with my scientist hat on, then you have to wonder how skewed is that data and what what's that telling you versus different types of data sets. But you, you can go on forever with that kind of question. But no, I haven't I haven't done the comparison. I did do a what did I do? I did a comparison with oh, that, that wasn't Python. Never mind. I did I did some some other stuff. I actually wrote a program where I compared an array multiplication, was it? Um, and I turned on multiple, and this was all in C, and I turned on multiple processors, and then I turned off the multiple processors, and I, I couldn't believe it. I actually found out there was almost a linear relationship. Like, it, it actually doubled if you had two processors. Now, I wasn't doing other code, and it wasn't doing interrupts, and it wasn't doing a whole lot of stuff, but the pure computation was was basically twice the speed, and I really didn't expect it to, to actually perform that well. It's because uh, the collisions, the data collisions, mm -hmm. was twice as good. No, I, I broke up the array so there weren't data collisions. Oh. So you're saying it was faster with the multiprocessor? Yeah, twice as fast <laughs> with two processors. Yeah. I had it where it doubled because of data collisions. Because <laughs> of data collisions? <laughs> if you're accessing the same array, you're accessing the same. Yeah. Right. Can't do that. Yeah. So in that, depending on what it does for the collisions, it, it actually could have more than doubled for, for that scenario. Other comments, questions? Okay, well, thank you very much. And now we get to see all of Matt's C code. <laughs> Now we can't quite get far enough to the left to shut the machine down. Can we see the code first? Oh, you want to Yeah, Well, I mean, yeah, it's, actually I implemented the try a little differently than the diagram I showed you, but my favorite editor. Um, so it's, uh, I, uh, just to make a long story short here, I came up with a structure, a node structure. So the way I'm doing it is a little different. I'm, I have child nodes, so you, you got your B. Remember that example where I got you, the first thing was a B? So, well, actually, you start with a start node, and then its child nodes are A, B, C, whatever. But it only actually goes to one child node. It has only one link to a first child node, and then there's a list of child nodes at that level. So th that list would be called sibling nodes. So once you get to a child node, then you can follow it to all the sibling nodes. Uh, that's a bit of an unorthodox way to implement it, I guess. Um, there's a variable in, this, in the node, called a Boolean called is word ending. That tells you if this is a word ending and you should stop, or you should keep, keep searching, keep looking. Um, and not so much if you stop searching, but because you'll stop searching, but it tells you you can print this out or you can put it in the list or do whatever you're going to do with it. And there's the actual data. Um, and then we, we uh, specify a start node. And we, we're going to build up this list of all substrings. So it's what we're going to return. So all substrings is um, 
going to be going to start to be null, and we didn't really need to make it a uh, a, a doubly in, a doubly reference whatever you call it doubly indexed array because we're just returning it as a list of uh, as it's one long string really. We're actually breaking it up at the end, I think. Um, I think to get this to work properly, I had to forward reference all this stuff. Maybe I was simply to conform to a C standard the compiler was defaulting to. I think it had nothing to do with the Python. Um, and I don't know how much, I mean, there's a lot of code. I don't know how much of this code you want to see, but there's code, it, it's standard stuff. There's code to add nodes, there's code to, well, let's get to the search. All the, all the initialize does is, uh, what does the initialize do? It, it allocates the thing and makes, makes the child nodes null and puts a null character in the start node, so the start node is not a real, not, not a real part of the search. You're already on the start node when you start. Then there's a match function. There's, so there's two functions that do the search. There's a search from a given point, and then there's get all substrings, which um, search from the beginning. And I mean, it deals with matches. I don't think we really need to go, in this forum here, need to go through all this code. And, um, is this available on GitHub? No, but if you want it to be, it can. That'd be useful. Then we'll okay. Look at it. Okay. Well, let's see what else I can point out that I haven't pointed out. Um, I'm sorry. What I meant to say was there's a get substrings, but then there's also a get all substrings. So here's the thing that this is. This is something that Python's actually calling, and um, starts. Puts you at the start node. Gets all the substrings. Um, does some lowercase conversion so that I mean initially when I wrote this it was case sensitive, but typically these things aren't case sensitive. Um, and let's find. Let's find. Oh, here's something I didn't mention. So the old Pi Inc ref and was it Dec ref? You have to. If you're writing C code and you're creating Python objects, you have to make sure of your reference counts. So you have to increment and decrement manually your reference counts. And here's some here's part of the code I showed you, uh, where you're setting the item and you're going to the next node. So you're this whole area from here to here is is going through the list. <laughs> um, populate is originally I was populating the list in in C, but I'm now populating the list, um, not the list. Well, it, it is a list. The countries with a um, strictly Python program, and there's the stuff I showed you. The stuff you just put it at the bottom, the, the kind of supporting code, and that's it. So you, yeah, I'll put that on, and you can look at it. Okay. Uh, oh, I got it. Init zero. <laughs> no, that didn't work. <coughs> this is because I can't find the uh, get to the left corner of the screen. Shutdown space H. Space what? Down H. Space. 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 Space what? N O W. Now, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Like a true command line programmer. Are you going to need the, the table space then? Uh, I believe this belongs to someone that's not. Me. 
All right, real quick, uh, while we have slight intermission, Sarah, one of our longtime members, brought cookies, and they're still warm. All right, we'll get this one started. So good evening, everyone. My name is Matt McKay. I'm a developer evangelist for a great little company in San Francisco called Twilio. Uh, we are an API for sending and receiving text messages and making and receiving voice calls. So anytime you call an Uber and it sends you a text message, your driver's on the way, the driver calls you up or you call the driver, that all goes through our service. So we enable that for Uber and other companies. This talk is called Full Stack Python. This is coming out of a website that I wrote, uh, fullstackpython.com. Uh, I'm just kind of curious how many people have come across it when you're researching uh, Python or trying to figure something out, just a show of hands, have read full stack Python before? Yes, we did. Okay, cool. <laughs> so uh, only about, uh, only a few of you, so great. So the general concept behind full stack Python is there's a lot of disparate pieces in the Python web space. And it can be difficult to understand in clear terms what every single one of those pieces does. So when you talk about what is a WSGI server, what's a clear definition of a WSGI server? So that is what I put on Full Stack Python, and some of that information I've distilled into this talk. So I would absolutely love to get feedback from you guys. This is a talk um, I'm going to give at EuroPython in Berlin in a couple of months. So if there's anything that's unclear or you guys have questions, please just stop me at any point. I want to make sure that when I'm in Berlin, I'm repping DC well, and that this is a talk that is well received when I'm there. Okay, so one of the things that I think is so amazing about being a developer is you can wake up in the morning and you can have this idea, just an idea that pops into your head, and you say to yourself, it would be amazing if we could do this with software. And you can build that. You can literally change the world by putting something on the web, looking at data in a different way, or creating a web application that makes people more productive. That's the power that we have. And that's what I think is so amazing about the Python web stack. When we put together a web application with Python, and I know a lot of you are in the data analysis space, when we build something in the Python space with, with a Python web application, we can put that out there, and we can literally change the world. So, when we talk about Python, we want to build a web application. If we don't know anything about web applications, and maybe we're just still getting started with Python, we would take a look at you know, our Python interpreter, we would read a book, maybe learning Python, we would learn the basic Python syntax. If statements, while loops, yield, generators, all those concepts. But ultimately, we're not going to write, we're not going to go read the HTTP spec and say to ourselves, yeah, I'm going to go write like a Python web application just with Python. Chances are what we're going to do is we're going to pick up, after we've learned the basic Python syntax, we're going to pick up a web framework. And that web framework is going to provide us with certain things. So that is going to provide us with URL routing. So when we say we build our, let's say we build a blog app, web application, blog, forward slash blog, forward slash one, two, three. That URL has to map to something in our code. And we pull that perhaps out of the database. We have some sort of database interaction that, that goes along with pulling that blog, the information that's going to be displayed in that blog post. And we also might have authentication mechanisms, so a user can log into our blog and maybe they post comments or something like that through their user account. We also get other features, output templates, so we may be displaying HTML for part of our blog, but maybe we want a machine readable format, which is in JavaScript object, object notation or maybe in XML uh, format as well. And we get some structure to our code. So when we take a look at the code that's produced with a web framework, we can immediately see 
how is this organized? Because there is some sort of standard, whether that's a de facto standard or actually in the way that the, the framework itself forces you to write the code, it provides code organization. Now, there's a couple different frameworks that most of us would pick up. One of them is Django. So I know that a lot of people here are uh, uh, data analysis. Uh, there's a lot, if you ever want to put your data analysis on the web, obviously IPython Notebook is great for just putting up raw data analysis in, on the web. But if you want to actually build a web application around it, you might use something like Django or Flask. Flask actually started as an April Fool's Day joke and turned into an incredible web framework. So these two frameworks, what's interesting about them, when we look at them from a very high level, they are on two opposite ends of the spectrum. So Django is a framework that says batteries included. If there is a codified way of doing something in the framework, database manipulation, for example, we use an object relational mapper, that is built into core Django. And that is what you're supposed to use. Sure, you could you know, circumvent it, you could maybe pull it out, but that's a pain in the ass. And anything that the community uses over and over again gets put into the core framework. We see this with the 1.7 release with migrations. Now that's being put into Django because through the project, which is known as South, migrations, it's not necessarily a solved problem, but it's solved well enough that it should be in the core framework itself. On the other end of the spectrum, we have Flask. Flask says small core but lots of extensibility. We should be able to mix and match whatever components we want. If we don't want an authentication layer, we don't need it. We're just going to manipulate something out of the database and nobody logs into our website, we'll just display that information. So we can mix and match the best libraries from the open source world with Flask. And then there's other frameworks that would fall along the spectrum. Uh, I would say that Pyramid would probably be closer to the, the Flask model. We've got, uh, there's another one called Bottle, which is basically just a one file for everything that you would want to do. There's different frameworks that would fit into this, this framework. Or different frameworks that would fit in along the spectrum. And this is actually something that can be abstracted to greater than just Python. In the Java space, there's something similar. Ruby space, you'd have Ruby on Rails on that side with Django, and you'd have Sinatra over here with Flask. The great part about this is we don't have to have any sort of arguments about which is better because we have Whiskey. We can calm down and we can just have Whiskey. Whiskey stands for Web Server Gateway Interface. And this is a standard that has been designed by the community <coughs> in Python Enhancement Proposal 333 and plus another three for updating for Python 3. Yeah, all that. So <laughs> Say that again fast. Sure. <laughs> These two enhancement proposals, this one with the four threes, has superseded the previous one, but if you follow the, this one here, it also matches this one. These define a standard, and if you read through the enhancement proposals, what you'll see is it's a very simple concept. There should be a server, the, the actual terms that are used in the Python enhancement proposal, a server or a gateway, those are interchangeable terms. And they should be able to invoke a callable object on our Python application or framework. Again, interchangeable terms that we have there. That is the basic concept behind the Python enhancement proposals for Whiskey. What I found, though, as I was doing all my research, I found very quickly this gets complicated. Once we start talking about, well, how do we deploy this, all the stuff that's behind it, that's why I created Full Stack Python, and that is why I wanted, I wanted a resource where I could take all of this knowledge that was sort of built up in my head and start explaining it to people and not be so complicated about everything. Like, just give me, like, wh why do I need to use this? Like, why is this important? Why is this necessary? So when, when uh, normally what I do is when I give a talk, I'll write a blog post that will be something related to the talk so you can read it afterwards. In this case, as I posted on Meetup, if you go to Full Stack Python, every single concept that I talk about here tonight has a separate page. So you can read about what a Whiskey server is. You can see the same diagrams that I have on this, on this presentation, so you can follow up with it in case you need to build a web application with Python. Okay, just to wrap up the Whiskey server part, there's implementations of Whiskey servers. So Django and Flask are implementations that implement the, the 
PEP, stand, PEP 3333 standard for a WSGI application. There are, there are also servers that implement the PEP standard for being a WSGI server. So some of them you may have heard of before. Green Unicorn is one that I use uh, quite a bit. I use this with, with uh, the Nginx web server. There's also Mod WSGI if you're going to use the Apache web server. There's a couple others that, have, that are becoming really popular, UWSGI. Uh, there's also Cherry Pie, which actually combines the concept of a web server and a whiskey server. Now, if you have not worked with any of these before, I'm going to show them in a map in a couple minutes. So hopefully you can get an idea for how these pieces fit together. But before we can show that map, we need a place to take our application and our, our whiskey server, all the Python code that we have, and put it somewhere. Like that needs to go and execute on some computer somewhere. So we've got you know, a server and an operating system that we need. And these are my biased recommendations for what you should be using, particularly when you're just getting started. So for the server options, we could talk about bare metal. Sometimes people say bare metal. That means we can go buy a server, or we can even take my laptop, stick it in a closet somewhere, connect it to an internet pipe, and then just that'll be the server. We'll give it a static IP address, and then we can map our URL domain name to that IP address, and it can just serve traffic on the internet. More likely, we're going to use something like a virtualized server. So we'd go to Linode or DigitalOcean. We'd rent a server on a maybe a monthly or yearly basis that we could deploy. They will handle if, for example, the hard drive burns out or there's any sort of maintenance issues. If you're running your own servers, you have to not only be worried about the software, you have to be worried about the hardware itself. And that's just a real pain. So it's better to have everything virtualized in some ways, because then they can, if one of the servers, the actual hardware burns out, they can shift it over to a different server, and chances are you won't even know that that happened. There's a couple other options. Not going to talk about it tonight. If you want, you can read about them. Uh, infrastructure as a service. We're talking about like Amazon Web Services, Rackspace, uh, and a bunch of the Azure. The, uh, the big companies are really in this space. And platform as a service, something like Heroku, uh, and, and there's other ones that will specifically run Python like Gondor. We're going to focus on, most of the deployments I do are on virtualized servers. So when I talk tonight, it'll be from the concept of a virtual server for the most part. Virtual private server, they're often called. VPS. I always use Linux. Whatever flavor of Linux, I often use Ubuntu. A lot of people use CentOS or CentOS. Um, no one can ever agree on what to call that. I say CentOS because it's generally shorter. There's also core OS, which we're moving into this, we're map rapidly moving into a containerized world with uh, Docker and some of these lightweight containerized platforms. So core OS is something that is growing in popularity. But ultimately, we're building on the Linux kernel, and that is what I recommend. In fact, when I was doing consulting work uh, for Python clients, and they would say, well, yeah, can't we just deploy this on Windows? I would say, we're not going to do the project if we're going to deploy to Windows in a production environment. That's just not, it's not going to happen. And I understand that there's obviously companies with constraints, but I always say you should be deploying on Linux. So you have... Because? Because? Because the packages, uh, so if you're trying to install certain Python packages, there's a, there's a bunch of different reasons. One of them is just from a systems administration standpoint, automating the configuration of Windows servers is awful. It's completely atrocious, and uh, good luck doing that. Automating the configuration of a containerized Linux server, not a problem, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Okay, one more piece that we need to fit in here, and then I'll show you guys a map. We need a web server to handle the web traffic. So the language of the web is HTTP. We've got Apache, which has been around for a very long time. <coughs> also Nginx, which is growing in popularity. And I actually read that it now is uh, powering a significant, actually a majority of the top 10,000 websites on the web. Um, but really, chances are most of those websites are using a combination of Nginx and Apache because there's different configurations for Nginx. Both of these incredible pieces of technology, and you can use either one as your web server for, for Python on top of Linux. Okay, real quick, here's how this sort of looks from sort of a flow perspective. I like to think about things from different angles. One of them is just user's web browser. What happens when they say, go give me this website? It goes out to the web server, let's say it's Nginx, and Nginx has a pass-through to our WSGI server. 
And the whiskey server is actually what's executing our Python code. It's executing our, our application. The whiskey server's output is, in this case, an HTML page. It is literally generating the custom HTML that is then passed to the web server and then passed back to the web browser. Now, inside, when we do our view source on that HTML, we would see something like style.css, cascading style sheet. We'd see some JavaScript in there. And then the web browser, most likely, is just talking directly to the web server. The whiskey server does not matter at that point because it's not generating cascading style sheets or JavaScript in most cases, particularly in a production environment, the web server would be transmitting that back. So that's, that's how this would work from a breakdown of the responsibilities that we would have for a web server and a whiskey server when a web browser or some sort of client contacts that web server. So what we end up with is our server, maybe a virtual server, Linux running as our operating system, and then it, on, on top of Linux, we have our web server, and that is passing requests to the whiskey server or gateway. Now, there's something that's missing here, which obviously is our application. So I'm going to introduce the concept of source control. So chances are, at DC Python Meetup, most of you are familiar with source control, so I'll fly through this pretty quickly. We have a couple options here in what I consider the modern development world. We have Git here on your left and Mercurial. So we might have one of these hosted at GitHub or Bitbucket, or maybe we're self-hosting our repositories on some separate server. But ultimately, what we end up with is the same diagram, but now we're going to get our application code on the Linux server by pulling from our source repository. Now, this is one potential setup for a production environment. There are other people who believe that you should not pull directly from source code. You should package your files in order to deploy to production. But I often say to people that are just learning how to deploy their applications, give this a try. It's, you'll understand how the server is set up, and then you can figure out a slightly more complicated way of handling packaging your application in the future. But this is a very simple way uh, to just pull down your source code and have it execute. The problem with this situation right now, though, is, is that there's a piece missing, in that we have dependencies in our source code. It's not just we've written the application and that's everything. Chances are we're dependent upon Django, we're dependent upon other helper libraries, other frameworks that we may be using at the same time, and so we need a place to put that code so we can execute that. We've got dependencies. So if you were to look at most Python web applications, and you take a look at the source code. This is just one that I pulled, and I apologize, this is probably very small for some of you guys, especially in the back. What we see here is a requirements.txt file. Requirements.txt, this is a web application. This is an open source repository that I have of a, a Django app that I've written. And we have a requirements.txt file that contains the dependencies. If we were to go into that file, what we would see is something like this with a little bit larger font size. Uh, which we have specific dependencies, specific Python libraries, and we've pegged to specific versions. Just a note, just so you're, you know, just for to be helpful, always peg your dependencies for whatever project you're using because I have projects that are like three, four years old. I did not peg my dependencies and they do not work at all now. So make sure you depend, uh, peg to either dependent version numbers or specific tags within uh, you know, a Git or, or some sort of repository that you're using for source control. So we need a way to take these dependencies and put them on our server. But we need some place to put them. And that is where the virtual env comes in. So oftentimes when you're talking to people and they're not from the Python world, you say virtual env, they're like, oh, no, I don't, I don't know virtualization like, or something like that. Well, so in the Python world, virtual env, you could say that maybe it's, it should have been named something else, but it is essentially a project that allows us to have an isolated Python execution environment with its own site packages. So we're separating, if we have to run Django 1.5 for one of our projects, we have one virtual env for that. If we have another virtual env that needs, and that project needs to run Python, uh, I'm sorry, Django 1.7, we separate that out completely. They have their own separate virtual ems, so we don't have this mix and match and, and all sorts of uh, issues with our dependencies. So it will look something like this. So we create that virtual em, this, this Python execution environment, and now we need to load our dependencies. 
So we go back to our requirements.txt file, and we would probably run something like this. pip install dash r requirements.txt. We would take our requirements file, and then we would pull them down from PyPI. So PyPI is a centralized repository for the Python community to pull down dependencies. So anyone here, anyone in this room, if you write a great library and you, you package it up, you can put it on uh, PyPI. And then other people can just do a pip install of your library. So I actually, I have one that's up there. It's called uh, Underwear. So the idea is basically to make it super easy to deploy to, uh, to tradi uh, traditional LAMP stack to a server. So pip install underwear would be the way that you would use that library. So this is a community resource that we use to install our dependencies into our virtual environment, our little virtual env here. And so now we've got the setup that we need in order to actually execute this. We've got our web server passing requests to the Whiskey server. The Whiskey server is invoking the callable object in our application, and the application is depending upon isolated dependencies in this virtual env, which have been pulled down from PyPI. That sets up our web server for the Python web stack. But there's this is the execution environment. There's actually like a really important missing piece here, and that missing piece is the data. So we need to add a database to this application in most cases in order to make it useful. So let's say we've got a bunch of data analysis that we've, we've done, and we stick the results in a database so that we can pull them out later. How do we get that set up? Most likely we're going to use a relational database. There are no SQL databases that we could use. Uh, I think that um, most of that is, you know, when we really scale out, you're looking at really large web applications, that's where most of those become very useful. Uh, so most of the time we're just going to be working with a relational database. If you want to know more about the difference in relational databases or how you might be able to use NoSQL databases, there are actually two separate sections on full stack Python for that. So with the relational database, we have a couple of options here. We have MySQL and Postgres. Hopefully you guys in the back can read that, just MySQL. Uh, in general, I <coughs> went with Postgres because MySQL was purchased by Oracle. Uh, people were confused as to how Oracle could purchase an open source project, but essentially they were purchased the assets around the project. Um, and there's a lot of consternation that perhaps this project is not evolving in the same way that it should be. So most people use Postgres. In fact, if you're using the Django framework, the Django framework is tested against Postgres. So I prefer to work with the database that the people in the Python community have sort of coalesced around and said, this is our the database that we're actually using for our development purposes. Note that SQLite is actually embedded within Python itself, but you don't use SQLite in a production environment because it does not handle more than one database connection at a time. So the issue with that, obviously, is unless you're the only person using your web application, uh, or even if uh, you know you have a, a background process running, it's not just about the number of people, it's also about the number of, of workers in the background that may be accessing that data. That can be a problem. All right, so let's say we set all that up. And now we have, a set, let's say we'll put it on a separate server. So we've got two, sep two independent servers here. We've got our web server and we've got our database server. Technically, you could put the database on the web server if you had a small scale deployment. Uh, but you know, for the most part, it's better just to separate them out so you know, okay, our data is over there and our application is over here. All right, so, and we can get up and running with this if we want to. Um, but there's some other pieces here that we're, we're kind of missing. And, and, and one of them is, if we've set all this up by hand, and I certainly have, I've run shell scripts, I, and I've, I've, you know, sudo app get install libraries, what did I install two weeks ago? I, I really don't remember. What we need is actually to be able to make this repeatable. So we don't just set it up once and let it sit in the closet for five years because you know, we need to be able to maintain this. We need something called configuration management. Configuration management software automates the deployment process. And, and this is still a deployment and configuration process. And this is still an evolving area, but there's really four main pieces of software that have 
that are most you're most likely to come across in the community and the most likely you're going to want to use to automate the setup of your infrastructure and your and to set up your application deployments. So these would be Chef, Puppet, Salt Stack, and Ansible. I will just uh, save you the trouble. I am a huge Ansible fan. I have actually contributed to the Ansible project, so I am totally biased in favor of Ansible. I think it is absolutely the easiest way to get all this stuff set up. I'll just get that out of the way ahead of time and just say, try Ansible, it's awesome. I tried all the others and I was like, this is just like too complicated. Tried Ansible, got up and running in three or four hours, was good to go. Okay. The so now- The are terrible, just so everyone knows. What's that? The puppet documentation is terrible. Yeah. So everyone knows. Yeah. It's really, really bad. Yeah, I mean, I even did puppet training and it was still very difficult to understand. Um, also too, just a side note, um, so uh, actually it goes right into this into this slide is that the configuration management generally runs on a separate either a separate server or maybe you kick it off from your laptop right there and then that is what is going to it's going to execute over some sort of a separate pro, a port uh, maybe through a proprietary protocol like with the case with with a chef or puppet or it'll go over SSH and so what I really like about Ansible is that it's agentless. So you don't have this uh, master node that is controlling all the other ones with an agent running on each one of them. With Ansible, everything is purely running over SSH. And in fact, the other tools have recognized that that is so powerful that they've actually started to shift their model towards only uses, using SSH. So that may actually be completely shifting in industry. But for DC, that's really important because a lot of times you know, security is not going to allow you to install an agent on every single one of thousands of potential machines out there. So it's great to have something that just works over, over SSH, which you know is already secure. Okay, so that shows how we're basically setting up. We have you know, configuration, we push out our configuration and deployment, and it would automate the setting up of this, this whole server. So we've got a few other pieces that we probably should talk about as well. Um, web analytics. Web analytics answers the very philosophical question, is there anyone out there, or anyone out there, anyone out there, right? We don't know who's using our application, uh, or we don't know how they're using our application until we install some sort of analytics. We could write our own analytics package, but for the most part, people are going to install something like Google Analytics, or install PWIC, uh, or have some, uh, there's a bunch of other analytics software as a service platforms that are out there. Um, but this is going to answer the question is how, how are people using our web application? Who is using it? So at least we have some sort of, at least if nothing else, we got some free graphs, right? Like we can show people like, look at, look at these graphs. Like this shows that like what I built is, is cool, I think, maybe, I don't know. Uh, so we can start to break things down by month, you know, by week, and see how many people are using our application, what pages are they going to, and start to dive into, is this application actually, the original idea that we conceived of, actually as useful as we thought it would, would hopefully be. All right, now we've got our application set up, we find out people are using it, and suddenly we find out that there's, you know, some issues. So hopefully we've set this up in the beginning, but we really need a couple things like logging and monitoring. And I'm going to fly through some of these topics, but they are incredibly detailed with how you would set them up. Um, there are open source projects that will allow you to do your own logging, logging aggregation, analyze what, what errors are occurring or what, what things might be a problem in your application. Um, and likewise, monitoring. The way that these two generally break down is logging is just kind of going on in the background. Yes, you're, you're, monitor, you're, you're logging errors, but you're also logging just normal events so that you can go back through time and see how your application is performing. Monitoring is often done more from a performance management standpoint. So, okay, what database queries are, are slow? There's a lot of bleeding together of these two pieces, so that's why I actually grouped them together. <coughs> they answer the question of like, when there's an error, what ultimately went wrong, and how do we then recover from it. So here is how the three pieces that we just talked about, the analytics, uh, let's say we're going to use hosted services, or we will host an open source project on our own servers. Here's basically how this would look. And actually, I've 
when I was first starting out with you know setting up Google Analytics and setting up uh, New Relic for monitoring and and using Sentry to handle my logging, I never actually found a diagram like this. So that's why I thought I would create it and walk through it with you guys because um, I thought this was this was something that showed where our data is going because I never was really sure like where where is everything. So let's say that we have a request from the web through you, you know, a user's browser sends a request, access this web application, and our web application is responding to that request. Now, if something goes right or something goes wrong, we probably want to log that information. So we might log it on this server itself, but more likely this server arrangement, let's say we're scaling out our web application, is going, you know, it could be a thousand servers. So we want a central hosted logging either server with open source project, or maybe we use something like Logly that is a software as a service platform that allows us to consolidate those logs. So that data would then be transferred to that hosted logging platform. Now let's say we've installed Google Analytics as a part of our JavaScript in our page. We've input that little snippet for our, for our project. Uh, and so in that case, the Google Analytics uh, this is slightly changing, so I'll, I'll explain the difference. It used to simply be that it would go from the user's browser into Google Analytics platform. It was just, uh, I'm sorry, hosted, an hosted analytics, JavaScript reporting analytics. There's a slight change now. Google is responding to other, other platforms such as Mixpanel that allow you to actually send events from the server side into their platform. So that is starting to change. So it's possible that in some cases your web server or your server in general would be sending, probably actually the Whiskey server would be sending events, executing Python code and sending events to your analytics platform. But for the most part, a lot of what happens with web analytics is happening on the user's browser side. Then the one other piece here is the hosted monitoring. So oftentimes there are errors in the JavaScript that occur on a user's browser. We'd like to see that. We'd like to know that users are running into errors in their JavaScript. So that would send data to that hosted monitoring platform. And likewise, we would send from both, uh, probably more likely mostly from our Python code, we would send events to the hosted monitoring. And a lot of those events are not necessarily going to be errors. They're going to be just metrics that occur there's going to be some sort of agent. So if you use something like New Relic, which is a, a platform for monitoring, you would have an agent that is running, instrumenting your Python code, and then sending that instrumentation information, that, that raw data, back to their monitoring platform so that you can inspect it later. So that's basically how this, this would be set up from a, from a logging, a monitoring, and a web analytics perspective. One other thing that I wanted to touch on is task queues. So we've talked a lot about user's browser going to our application, it does some work, and then we send back a response. But we also need Python code to do things outside of the traditional HTTP request response cycle. And that's where the task queues come in. So there's a few different options here. The one that's most popular is Celery. Uh, Celery is a task queue that relies on some sort of messaging uh, messaging uh, protocol in the back, uh, so something like a RabbitMQ or even Redis, so that it keeps track of what work needs to be done and then pulls things off of that, that message broker and says, okay, what, what code do I need to execute? And it's just doing this constantly in the background. Um, there's a couple other options. One is Taskmaster, which is the idea that uh, Celery has become too cumbersome, therefore we should just have a very lightweight task queue. Um, that's an option. And then RQ, which actually stands for Redis queue, which is, again, let's have a lightweight option instead of having to default to Celery every single time, which can sometimes be overkill for every single application. So how does this affect our server situation? Now, I put this message broker here for simplicity's sake, but oftentimes this will also be on a separate server. Um, essentially, our code that's running, let's say we have Celery installed, is going to be relying on that message broker in order to keep track of what work needs to be done, and then we'll, we'll take off the queue, what needs to be done, and then execute that in, for, in, in, our, in our WSGI environment. So that will allow us to execute Python code outside the standard HTTP request response cycle, and that's the way that that is set up. We covered uh, a lot of ground, and 
that actually really gets us pretty far. We go live with our application and we're actually very ready to take on a lot of traffic to understand how users are using the application. We can respond to errors when they occur. So we go live. Um, I just put a screenshot of an application that I um, you know, built one time uh, that basically used a bunch of these technologies. Um, that, that this was the idea behind this was that uh, if you're not using source control on your project on a software development project, um, there are real costs associated with that. So this would uh, you could punch in a bunch of assumptions and it would spit out this whole report telling you that if you didn't use source control, uh, then you were losing X number of dollars per day based on the cost of your project. And uh, this was actually very useful in environments where people did not believe in the value of source control or certain technologies. So I'm sure many of you have run into this in DC. Uh, so that was an application I built that used a lot of the, the software that we, uh, the, the, the different parts of the web stack that we just previously talked about. So just to wrap up, you're going to use a web framework that is going to implement the WSGI application slash framework side. It is going to work with a WSGI server, which is implementing the WSGI server slash gateway side of the WSGI protocol. We're going to have most likely a virtual private server or a bare bones server. We're going to install Linux on top of it, some flavor of Linux. We have a web server, whether that's Apache or Nginx. We've demonstrated app dependencies. So how do you how do you peg your dependencies, uh, what libraries you're, you're actually using, and then you go out to PyPI, pull those down into your virtual env so that you have those in an isolated execution environment. And then above and beyond that sort of initial state of running our application, we have, oh, I'm sorry, we also have databases which would store the data in a, most likely in a relational way. So more stuff, we would automate the configuration management of that. We would have web analytics, we would have logging, which would keep track of what are some of the errors that are occurring, some of the events that we need to know about. Again, likewise, we would have something with monitoring and task queues. So that is, I believe, 11 pieces that we would need to fit together in order to run most Python web stack applications. There's a few others just to touch upon. There are pages specifically for these. I didn't even touch upon the cascading style sheets or the JavaScript. And increasingly, the applications that are written are being done in JavaScript on the front end. So we, that's where we have trends like AngularJS, BackboneJS, where they're executing more code in the browser to create this rich UI experience. And then the application itself, for the most part, is actually just serving up data instead of ser serving up the actual HTML itself. Application programming interfaces we didn't even touch on. Not only integrating them, so if we're going to use Twilio to send and receive text messages, we would also create APIs so that if we're going to use AngularJS to create this rich UI, we're accessing a JSON backend that is our own API that we've exposed. Web app security is a very important topic. Uh, NoSQL data stores are something that um, have their uses but have often been uh, very sexy, but not, they don't always have their place in every single application until you start to scale to a certain point, but they certainly do have. I, I, I have a page specifically on NoSQL data stores, and that has immediate use cases for how you can use them for, for example, um, well, I, I caching as, as another topic. Um, infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, so that you can, platform as a service, so you can just deploy your code and not have to worry so much about setting up the server and the operating system, and then static content, serving it instead of from your web server from a content delivery network. So most of these topics are something that, uh, with the exception I would say of, of CSS and JavaScript, potentially even APIs, are something that after you've built your application, the initial sort of get it out there, these are going to be, these become much more important topics that you should research and understand as you're starting to scale out your web application. All right. So that is a very, very quick overview of all of these disparate pieces. I've got just a few resources. Um, one is I will, I'll send out this link, I'll post it on Meetup, and I will tweet it out after this. Um, just a few resources. I often have a lot more resources, um, but these are just real quick. Uh, one is the Full Stack Python website itself, 
which has every single one of these topics laid out in clear English and also contains the best resources from around the web so that you can learn more. Um, I just wrote a blog post for O'Reilly which talks about some of the trends behind why developers are choosing to learn more aspects in, of, of the web stack in certain cases instead of, for example, just knowing how to work with an object relational mapper or just being a backend developer, why in certain cases it's really important to be able to build a complete application from end to end. Um, Full Stack Python is also an open source project. I built it with Pelican, which is a static website generator written in Python. So it's a good use case in case you ever want to, uh, it's a good project example in case you ever want to use a static website generator. And then this presentation is in Reveal.js and I just have this presentation source code out there. So, my name is Matt McKay. I'm a developer evangelist for Twilio. Uh, I am on Twitter at Matt McKay. I'm also on GitHub. I do pretty much all of my work is, on, is open source for the most part. I'm working with open source projects and my job to just do cool stuff and write blog posts about that um, that uses the Twilio API. Uh, if you have questions, please uh, shoot me a tweet um, or shoot me an email at McKay at Twilio, MatthewMcKay at gmail.com. Thank you for your time, guys. I appreciate it. Are there any questions at this point? Yeah, go ahead. Was Fabric on your radar when you were talking about puppet? Yeah, so Fabric uh, is basically a wrapper around SSH, uh, which allows you to write Python code that will execute on remote environments and also allows you to execute them on many environments at once. So it's largely a wrapper around um, SSH. Uh, so it would fit under the configuration management slash automation section of uh, Full Stack Python and do write that, write about that then. So, I mean, do you have an opinion on it versus. Sure. So, uh, so um, Ansible, for example, is really great at doing configuration management and deployment. Not so great for doing ad hoc, uh, working with shells or that sort of thing. I think Fabric is a much better tool for that. So for the most part, if you're going to use a configuration management tool, uh, it's often going to be great at getting your servers into a specific state and get your, your code onto the server, but it's not going to necessarily be great for doing ad hoc tasks with that, with that server. So that's where it would fit in, and you'd probably use it to augment one of the other tools. Yeah, is there any convergence on like REST API? I know there's uh, what, like TastyPy or sure. Django REST, but what? Yeah, uh, so there's a few things going on right now. One is it does seem like Django REST framework has become the uh, leading framework in the it's Django space. What's that? I might prefer Django REST framework. Yeah, that seems to be the emerging consensus. Uh, TastyPy is still being maintained, uh, but not at the same extent that it was before. Um, also, I believe the, um, I may be confusing some of the authors, but there's also a new one. I believe it's the, the person who created TastyPy has now created Restless. And the idea behind Restless is, is that you can create an a, a RESTful API in, let's say you have a Django app, but you could then you port to Flask later. You could use the same RESTless framework in order to you know have one API be transportable to the other. But that's still in the pretty early stages at this point. So if you're working with Django, Django REST framework, and then if you're working with Flask, most likely you're going to use Flask RESTful, um, which actually we open source. Uh, but also to um, Miguel Greenberg, to his new Flask book. He does talk about APIs, and he gave a really great uh, PyCon talk about just some of the standard stuff that you run into when you're creating an API in Flask, like rate limiting, authentication, token validation, that sort of thing. So I recommend that a lot. Miguel's done a lot of really great work in that area. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, all the technologies described, do you use them all in Twilio? Uh, so we use quite a bit of them internally. So we don't use Django, for example. Uh, we don't use, uh, it, well, internally, we, we don't use Django. Uh, we use a lot of Flask. We try to open source a, a bunch of that. So there's the two projects that we've uh, open sourced that have sort of had the largest um, following are Flask RESTful for building RESTful APIs, and then also Stashboard, which is a, a status, a hosted status board um, that you can put up on a Google App Engine, for example. Um, we don't use Ansible internally, um, but I am a, I'm a committer to Ansible. I wrote the Twilio module that allows you to, for example, if your deployment breaks or something goes wrong, you can send a text message to the appropriate people uh, for your project. 
um, so that they immediately know, okay, we have a problem in our deployment process, uh, I need to go fix it. Um, are there any particular uh, tools that you're interested in? I'm actually curious how you implement the actual SMS technology. Uh, oh, you're talking about on the back end. On the back end yeah. um, oh, so the interactions with the telecommunications. Yeah. Um, so we have some people that are very smart with SIP trunking, uh, which is you know the tele the proprietary. Well, I don't know if they're proprietary, but the telecommunications protocols. Um, and then I do believe we use Asterix um, to handle a lot of that stuff. So we've got a lot of custom code around that, but. Um, I'm actually not up on uh, the all the back end um, work that we're doing in that area. Other questions? Um, you yeah. don't have anything on caching. Um, yeah. No, it's to, uh, it's one that got uh, cut out. Okay. And uh, the hard part is is that um, well, this actually was supposed to be 30 minutes. It was actually 40 minutes, unfortunately, right. which means I need to be even tighter with the presentation because that's the time slot at EuroPython. Um, I would absolutely incorporate caching um, and multiple layers. Right, your, your CDN and your your bar, yeah. your split fronting the, the web app and then the uh, yeah. memcached or Redis, you know, which side of it. Yeah, exactly. So with uh, with full stack Python, I use I with every single section I give uh, I call it a learning checklist. It's sort of like if you've never done this before, here's some steps that most people take as their first steps. Mm -hmm. So under the caching, I believe it's under the caching section, it may be under the NoSQL section, um, because some of the, these topics are sort of interrelated, is Redis, use Redis, install Redis, and then use it as a mini caching layer for really complicated database queries. So run a task queue in the background that executes those database queries, stores them in Redis, and then have your application go to Redis as a cache um, to pull it out of memory instead of going to the database, if at all possible. Um, so that would be one way. But there's certainly other, yeah, using a CDN is an example of, of a caching layer for uh, the, the, the static files or uh, potentially even the media files that you would have as a part of your application. Other questions? Yeah? I'd actually like to hear more of your thoughts about, you know, this sort of using Angular to do some sort of client side stuff versus, you know, this is all back end. You know, like what are the pros and cons? Because you know, Angular is just so popular right now. Uh, uh, sure. Um, well, why don't we let uh, Fletcher and, and Josh in the back handle that one? Because they they have used Django for a ton of stuff and now they're they're using Angular as well. So what do you guys think is the, the transition, sorry to put you on the spot, but you, you can handle it. Um, I mean, I, I guess the, the basics are really obvious, but you know, there's so much you can do in terms of it's not going to have a not loading the data back. Um, and we essentially are moving to a model of what you mentioned before. Um, it's just Django serving up through a framework, an API, um, and you're doing everything. Um, so especially we do a lot of things like um, really complicated graphing where you're loading tons of data in and then through D3 you're manipulating in all sorts of ways. That, that's really costly to be sending back to the server. So if we can all if we can load all of that in once and then through Angular we can modify it all browser side, it's a huge benefit in okay. the time wise. Hmm. Yeah. Visualization. Yeah. Well it's not just that.